Salutare tuturor și bine v-am regăsit la un alt fel de IGDLCC. În ediția de astăzi vreau să vă aduc în fața camerei un vechi prieten, uh, an old friend, I might say. Are we friends? So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Very we, long we time. could say that. Pretty long time. Uh, I think have we have we got a decade behind us already? I would say I, it has to be 10 years, doesn't it? It has to be. Între timp Paul Grey a trecut prin mai multe companii. La început când l-am cunoscut eu se ocupa de cercetare în domeniul ecranelor. Uh, and you are the guy to always tell me before Uh, what kind of screens Apple might use? Yeah, we track the the whole of the display business exactly. from people who make panels all the way through to finished products. Exactly. So uh, I'm going to switch to English uh, fully now, so people uh, can uh, have it in uh, on one go. Um, I remember that you are so deep into it that you told me uh, two years prior that um, LCD panels are going to fall off a cliff in terms of pricing, and you're going to yep. see a lot of cheap TVs invading the market and then yep. they're going to go away. Yep. <laughs> so that's some foresight right there. Yeah, well, um, it's not just guesswork. So we we track people building panel fabs, um, ordering equipment, and we model the capacity. Okay. And we, we compare that to demand. Okay. So you can see how big the um, panel industry could be, how many panels they could yeah. make. And this is about square meters of glass and millions of square meters of glass. Oh, yes. And then we also forecast demand across the different product ranges and you see whether it matches up. Of course. And whether that is very tight supply or, you know, any shortage as happened in 2020 or as we are now where it's completely gone the other way, where now it is an oversupply and Ooh. everybody is fighting to find a way to sell their product and keep their fabs busy. So you already figured out we're going to have an interesting conversation today. We're going to focus on the state of the industry, but also the near future, because uh, this is going to be some a, a piece of very expensive free advice <laughs> from, a, from a top analyst uh, that's uh, actually his life work is tracking the market and trends and all that. And he's been so kind uh, to share with us uh, some of this uh, insight. Of course, uh, there's uh, much more to, uh, that you can buy. If you're a client of one of the companies he's been going through, he's been through a company uh, focused uh, in, on displays and yep. then on uh, general consumers yep. and now trade shows. Um, yes, I mean, that's our different owners, but we, uh, we've the same group of analysts who've worked together for uh, 15, 20 years. Okay. We have slightly different owners now, but we still do the same job. Okay, so like uh, some very, very high, highly skilled professionals yep. in your field and you're being uh, sold from one uh, company uh, to the other. Yeah, that's right. People uh, like buying and selling market, market intelligence companies. Market uh, intelligence companies, yep. knowing how the market works. That's right. From what I'm hearing from the, from the business industry, let's say big investors now are feeling the urge to understand more about the whole global thing, yep. not only specific markets. What's been changing? Uh, in the past two or three years? So the big one in the display business, and that then underpins everything else, is that the Chinese have out-invested everybody else in terms of LCD panel capacity. They've built these incredible Gen 10.5 fabs. They process a sheet of glass that's about the size of this backdrop behind us, so three and a half meters by three meters. And you go and cut that up into displays. And We believe they've overinvested. Um, they. What does that mean, overinvested? So they have made too much capacity. So there will be permanent oversupply for the next five years. So for the next five years, we go, we're going to see screens that are too cheap to be true. They are too cheap to give a good return to the people who made the fabs. Yes. Whoa. And, and it's the same with empty buildings in China. Absolutely, it's just the same as building too many apartment blocks that are empty. Um, having too much capacity to make cars, like has happened in Europe for a very long time, or steel making capacity. It's the same thing. People have built too much, um, you know, factory, uh, factory capacity. Uh, and the reason is that in China, people like very large TVs. And uh, many people have 65 or 75 inch TVs. It, it's on par with North America for TV size. I knew it was an American thing, is now... Yep. Uh, oh. uh, some, some of the time China was actually buying bigger TVs on average than the US. Okay. Um, even though people have smaller living rooms, they like a big TV in there. And they assumed when they made that investment that all the rest of us want 
equally big TVs and will move furniture <laughs> to, to get that TV in. Um, but, but you cannot make a small apartment bigger. Uh, you can't, no, indeed. And of course, that means that there's a finite size, regardless that, you know, in the end, if you get to, I don't know, 120 inches or something like that, you have no wall left. Um, yes. And we've also studied things like, for example, could you actually get the TV into the standard elevator for apartments and the building code in different countries? But anyway, we believe they've overinvested. At the moment, after the market has resettled from after the pandemic, then panel prices have fallen to a third of their pandemic levels. No way. Yeah. They're below cost. They're selling them below cost at the moment. Because otherwise... Um, because the, the panel business is one where most of the cost is the finance and building the fab. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the old joke that... Um, you know, if, if, you are, if you owe the bank a uh, $1,000, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, then the bank's got a problem. Yes. And for the banks, you know, this is a big problem if you stop production. Okay. Because there's no way so to So they're the forced to, pro uh, to, to make these screens for a third of the price, no matter what, just yep. to pay back their loans. They're just desperately trying to keep going and stay in the business. In a, in a way, it's similar to what's happening in the CPU industry, where the yeah. SML uh, big, um, let's say, rigs that make those wafers yep. need to be housed in buildings that are a billion each. Oh, more than that. I, I think, I think um, top-end IC fabs are over five billion now. Just the um, building? Uh, the building with the equipment and all the... Okay. Okay. Uh, and of course, you, you know, the, you've got all the... Uh, conditioning of the air and particle removal and everything else like that. Super but clean. that's still going well. The, um, the, the, the CPU industry is booming? It's, no, no, the PC industry has a, has a problem as well. Very similar one, resettling to new, demo, new lower demand levels over the pandemic. Okay. Um, if you look at the chip manufacturing, you know, there's been this chip shortage for, you know, two years. Yes. Um, it is now eased off at the top end chips. So the sort of things that are in servers, um, top end smartphones, PCs. Four, five, seven, eight nanometers. Yeah, let's say under 10. Under that's, 10. Na that's, now, um, that's now in oversupply again. Okay, oversupply? So there's, there's, so there's, there's, They're talking about uh, yeah. a, a lack of CPU. Right. And then you come to um, the mid range chips, okay. so 90 nanometers and smaller. Okay. And we think they'll be in balance by the end of the year. Then you get to power ICs. And because of the auto industry and a growing demand for power ICs for things like energy efficiency, more efficient motor drives and white goods and so on, um, they're actually going to stay in shortage. Um, okay. Because people are very unwilling to, as you say, invest billions of dollars in fab capacity. It's a... It's a it's a game for the brave. So that's the setup uh, for the near future. Now, yeah. let's break it down a little yeah. bit, if, you, if we can go even deeper mm. into that, because um, uh, the kind of insight that you have is, uh, let's say, unparalleled. So in terms of screens, you're telling me about LCDs. Yeah. And now you can have any kind of, uh, any size of TVs. Uh, the only limit is the uh, sheer size of the elevator <laughs> and the door that you can yeah. push it through. Yeah. Because we've seen that in IFA and other events that all manufacturers are pushing larger and larger yeah. TVs. But is there anything else beside a larger TV? I, I think you, you're right that the industry has relied on holding up prices by selling people bigger TVs. Yes. Um, and, and that has been a, a model that's worked for 15, 20 years. Uh, and it's ridden alongside what was possible to make in the... Uh, in, in, in the LCD fabs. Always people, we have to remember, they don't look at the TV, they look through the TV. Yeah? And, and in the end, it's about content. Um, and certainly, if you're watching highly compressed SD content, you probably don't want a 75-inch TV because it looks like you're watching Lego. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah? And, and, and there's always that, that issue. You have to remember that the TV serves the content. Um, I think we're now at what I described as the third wave of streaming. So we had audio streaming. Um, it was slightly different in those days, but um, it was audio delivered on the internet. Then we moved to video streaming. 
Um, and of course, you know, Netflix, Amazon, catch-up services from national broadcasters, YouTube is that second wave. Um, and the third wave is happening now, which is cloud gaming. So just like the other ones, you get away from having playback from packaged media to just it's another app that you run on your general purpose platform with processes in it. Um, so cloud gaming means that you don't need a console. Um, you're, to reduce latency, you still actually have to have the controller connected directly to the network rather than running through the TV to keep everything as fast as possible. But suddenly you can start playing the sort of things that were like console games, but without a console. Okay. Is that uh, going to be a reality anytime soon? Because we, we keep hearing about that for the past five or six years. Yeah, I think the technology is, is, is now at the point that we've got fast enough servers, the latency is being managed, broadband connections in general are fast enough. You know, even in me, Germany? Uh, even in Germany. I mean, the, the, big, the big surprise, I think, that came out of the pandemic was the internet didn't fall over. Yep. Yes. A huge change in consumer usage of the internet, lots of video calling, and the internet generally didn't fall over. And, you know, in most places, most people got an acceptable service nearly all the time. Yes. Yeah? And, and I, I think that really showed how much those investments were paying off. Okay. So, yes, I think the time is now right for cloud gaming, and these things have been, have been shown that it's mature. Of course, it will be a gradual introduction with the next generation of TVs. And as that happens, then people will learn their way into it and fix problems as they go. Okay, so larger screens and cloud gaming, yep. those are the big trends. Yep. But, but I, I, I keep remembering that you, you told me that no manufacturer is making any money on TVs smaller than 43 inch. Yeah, small t the small TV business. Is, is that is still tough. a thing? Um, yeah, it's, a re it's really affected by panel prices. So to give an example, in 2019, at the end of 2019, the panel price was about $30 for a 32-inch TV. Okay. Come to the pandemic, the panel price hit $90. So the panel price tripled. Because everybody was staying at home? Because of the shortage and everybody wanted to buy a TV. <laughs> and, and then some factories would, weren't open. Right. So if you, if you think about it, then you were trying to sell a TV that was at 140 euros, which is the same as 140 euros, excluding the VAT. When 90 euro, you already spent 90 dollars, 90, 90 euros of, of that on the panel. So yes. you know, there's, there was no margin there. So that was deeply loss making, um, which is why you saw 32 inch TVs kind of disappear in 2020, 2021. Yes. They're back now, but it's a very tough business. They're still moving boxes, not making any money out of it. On an awful lot of that, yeah. People make money on the large sizes. Only on the large sizes. But also this uh, price of the panels also uh, um, is involved in the whole industry uh, because um, the most expensive component in every gadget is the screen. Yes, yep. Even the iPhones. Yep, absolutely. The, um, the, you know, the display in a TV is something like a third of the, um, the retail price, typically, if you're going to make some money. Okay. So when you're introducing new technology, a third of that goes into the screen. Yep. Whatever the gadget is most of the times, let's say. Yeah, for TVs and things like for that. For TVs yeah. and things like that. But what about laptops, uh, laptop computers? Because we've seen them also being becoming very expensive. Yeah. And everybody's uh, waiting for the, the good uh, laptop for, I don't know, 400 euros. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the interesting one that's going on in the PC industry at the moment is that, again, just like consumer electronics where we had this pandemic surge the pc industry's got a pand had a pandemic surge also driven of course by enterprises switching their um, staff from working on desktops to working on notebook pcs remotely and again we've got that same inventory overhang so there are huge numbers of pcs in stock at the moment okay um, right the way across the supply chain um and I think, you know, for consumers, they're going to be some amazing deals late this year on, on PCs. PCs, notebook PCs, notebook PCs. Yeah. Okay. Amazing deals for the, let's say, for the, for the, I don't know, for the winter sale. Yeah, events absolutely. And stuff because like. people have to do that. So the sort of generation 11 PCs, there's a lot of inventory. 
probably there won't be that many generation 12 PCs and then, then the industry will jump straight to 13th generation from next year. So it's a good time to buy a PC. Really right now time. or in October, November? Oh, in, between now and the end of the year. Let's wait and see what happens. Okay, because we are in the market for some new computers and we are holding out <laughs> because of the huge prices. Yeah. It, it, it was getting crazy. Yeah. We had to buy something because yeah. it was, uh, we, 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 we really had to. But we didn't uh, overhaul anything because right. of, the, uh, of the huge prices. Right. But also now we're hearing from companies that they're telling their uh, employees to come back to the office. Yes. Like, like the Apple people did. Yeah. They, they told their uh, uh, people that you need to come back into the office at least f three days a week. And some of them are not in, not in the country. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting one that certainly I think you can see how the pattern of employment's changed. Um, and, and interestingly, in the US, I think there was this cultural thing that you had to be in the office. Yes. That shifted. It's going to change the patterns of um, wages in the US. It changes the pattern of home ownership. And remember that living in Silicon Valley within um, you know, even an hour and a half drive commute of Cupertino um, is very, very expensive. Yes. So um, for, I, I think we will see how these things settle and a lot of it depends on company culture. Well, I remember when I was driving through Silicon Valley, it was always, uh, always rush hour. Yeah. It was always rush hour. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, some companies were giving their employees electric cars or uh, uh, paying the tolls for HOV yep. just to get faster right. to work or stuff like that. It's, it wasn't an issue anymore during the pandemic. I've been yep. driving and it's been okay. But um, how, how do you see uh, this cultural change? Because Americans were very good because they were coming together in the office yep. and exchanging ideas and doing stuff. Now, even they learn how to work remotely. There are yep. some companies that said they will never go back to full-time uh, office um, work. Our, our company was the same. So our, um, our, our events business was very office-centered. And now it's completely changed. For example, we had two offices in London. We've closed one. Um, really? And we just, you know, for, the, for those teams, they come in. Um, it's all mi it's mixed working. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, you need, being together to collaborate is important. There's also times when you need to focus, and that's probably equally well done at home. So I think that mixed working is, is get, definitely going to be more like that. And certainly also in the... In the U.S., you've seen that the extreme cost of living pressures in in California, for example, have encouraged companies to spread out. And instead of having to set up satellite offices, for example, they can just have employees who work, work more remotely. You're a very experienced professional. You've been working your whole life traveling and stuff like that. But you always remember uh, the office work and you get back into the team uh, with the team and working together. How do you see the change? How is it affecting you? Because I'm not sensing any satisfaction when you're telling me there's uh, <laughs> from two offices, there are only one. Um, no, left. For, for me, I've worked from home for 15 years. Already? So my... Um, you are ready for this. Uh, we, for us, it was no change at all. It was completely business as usual. So, um, for example, in the team I worked in for television sets research, then the team members are in Japan, Taiwan, China, um, and Korea and the US. Okay. In, we, we'd only ever had the whole team together twice in 12 years. Wow. Um, and so it actually works. You're it, a living it, it, example. It absolutely works. You know, you, you, have to, you have to communicate differently. You have to be very careful how you communicate, especially because people will read it out of time. And so you have to signal when you're making a joke, when you're being sarcastic, and signal your emotional tone. Um, yeah, 90% of all language is, let's yeah. say, uh, uh, it's it nonverbal. It's nonverbal. And, and, and the interesting so I'm going to make a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I've just made a joke. Um, so I think those, those things are what really changed it. But um, actually, the interesting thing that came to us out of the pandemic was... About a year earlier, we'd, we'd switched to using, using Teams, um, but we were using it mainly for its tracking capabilities and its file management and progress management and, and collaboration. And it was only after the pandemic started that we actually switched on the video. We used to always call with the video switched off. 
<laughs> and obviously there's something there's that need to see more people and we then we now do our calls typically with a video on uh, okay. and that, that so even that for an experienced team that's worked a long time remotely yes for the first time we actually run with a video more we all have uh, uh, cameras on our smartphones yeah. we can all do video calls yeah. we've had that uh, capability for the past more than 10 years absolutely we only started u- using it and um, let's say three years into the pandemic almost now yeah, I, I think the pandemic, we were all locked away and we were just desperate for a bit more human contact and suddenly we all started switching the video up. But I, <laughs> I, I still see some situations where universities or companies, people decide they don't want to be seen. Yeah. I've had uh, video calls with people that wouldn't show their face. Yeah. You would only hear them. But now more and more people turn on their cameras. I, I think so. And I think the, we've got over the bit that you know maybe somebody's dog walks in um, in the back, and it's not seen as unprofessional anymore. Um, it's just we, we've all been there, you know, or a small child oh, yeah. comes in or whatever. And, you know, I, I think we, we've suddenly realized that we've just got a, a different positioning of our personal lives and our work lives now. Okay. That we all live over the shop. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and sometimes those things intrude, and we now see that as being charming rather than unprofessional, I would think. Okay. So how is that affecting uh, the way of doing business and also back to the technology side of things? Because we've seen a surge in, uh, let's say, also webcams. Yeah. And now prices are also uh, right. ca- coming off a cliff. I, I think one of the things that we, if you look at it, that, that has changed is that the demand for monitors has gone up. We saw the monitor market as being very stable, tied in with the desktop PC market, slowly kind of bu- bubbling under. Um, yeah. You know, important, but nothing more. One of the things I think that's really changed is that people have realized the benefits of running multi-monitors with a notebook PC and tethering now notebook PCs to one or two extra monitors. Um, and that has changed. So now the monitor is always there to expand the desktop size. You can't have enough pixels still. Okay. Yeah. So uh, instead of uh, the PC going away, now you can bring it back or use your own laptop with at least one screen. With with extra screens, I think people see that you you are, you know, it's it's really demonstrated that you are more productive when you can um, just switch things between rather than have to turn on and off and superimpose windows and so on. We're only human and uh, yeah, yeah, we can deal with that much. Yeah, and you know, I I think that we all, we all look at those sort of 49 inch super wide monitors and think, yeah, that would be really nice. You know, you just got to persuade the boss to buy one. But really, uh, yeah, I, I, you I, like I, those. I, I think I think in terms of the you can you can achieve the same thing by tiling three monitors. But that amount of desk space, I, I think on monitors is still there's there's room to grow and there's room for bigger monitors and higher resolutions. I, I don't know. Uh, I've I've tried many monitors, but uh, I'm stuck in uh, into 32 inches. Yeah. So the 32 uh, always looked like a good deal. Looked yeah. like a good deal. It was a, a good price. It was something in, into the 400 euros, 500 yeah. euros a few years back. It's gone up to 600 now. Yeah. I'm waiting it to come. It'll back come down, down again. <laughs> and even lower. Because the fabs are empty. Yeah, people. That, it will okay. come down again. I'm counting on that. <laughs> so 32, 4K. Okay, two of those uh, on a standing desk. Yeah. There's your uh, yeah, because office. you know at that stage, especially that re- you know that level of resolution, provided you've got a PC that can drive that, then you can suddenly start having very large amounts of mixed text and graphics and whole spreadsheets or whatever, all on your desktop. And if you think about what you can resolve with your eyes on a, you know, say one meter by sixty centimeters sort of desktop, which is would be a tabletop that you could manage and move objects around. It's finally getting back to a desktop that's the size of a desk. Yes. In terms of what you can see in your field of vision and put things around. If it was pieces of paper, you would do that. So you're saying it's you're actually becoming more productive if you bring in, instead of a laptop, just a guy with a laptop, you connect that laptop to two big screens, yep. at least 32 inch. Yeah. Okay, is that demonstrated? Or is uh, yeah, there, there, no, there, there are some ergonomics researchers at universities who have shown that actually there is an improvement in productivity. And you're, you don't become a hunchback? Hun- Probably hunch- not. No, you're not, you're not, you're not down like, I, I, I've now bought one of those USB-C um, monitors that you know, looks like a tablet, and I, I now travel with it. If I'm going away for two or three days, I'll travel with it. Okay. Um, 
you know, you know, and they're, they're not expensive. They're what 150 euros, something like that. And when they first appeared, they were much more, more expensive. Yeah. They're gone down. They're going to keep coming down even more. Probably because the panel prices are falling. So again, but I, I think I think those those for example now you're seeing people being much more adventurous with monitor formats. So portability, yes. USB C is a huge enabler of the technology. Of course you get away from all the extra power supplies and cords and things like that you'd have to put in your bag, mm -hmm. which is inconvenience and weight. Um, and, and the monitor industry has really woken up to thinking about consumers and how people use things. We've seen all these amazing gaming monitors appear. Um, we've seen many more monitors that are good for editing video or things like that, very close to gaming monitors in many ways. And portable formats, um, you know, for real mobility it, it's it's flowering again as a market we've seen tvs into the 55 inch yeah. category that are uh, so good that you can actually turn them into uh, gaming monitors yeah. uh, but that's specifically for oled yeah can you talk about oled because you've told me about lcd and that's mostly <laughs> yeah. china now yep yeah, absolutely and uh, oled is mostly south korea uh, oled is it, it, that, that that was the koreans plan that they they could see the Chinese investing more and more in LCD. And I think about five years ago, they looked at it and said, if this investment trend continues, then we won't have an LCD business. You cannot, it, you cannot compete on sheer size. Well, if, if other people are prepared to sell at or below cost, then that's not a great business to be in. So actually the Chinese are dumping on LCD and the, the um, Koreans cannot keep up. Uh, I won't use the word dumping because that has a very specific definition, which is selling cheaper overseas than in your home market. Uh, okay. Chinese TV prices are much lower than elsewhere in the world. Okay. So it's not dumping, but they are selling at very, very low margins. Okay. Yeah. And often negative. Negative margins. So okay. what we saw over the past few years was Samsung Display in particular played a very, very clever game to reduce fab capacity, they'd turn a fab off and that would induce tightness in the market, bring prices up, then they'd take another fab out of commission to so their generation seven fabs. Um, and they reached the end of the game now. So their last large LCD fab has stopped production now. Really? Yep. So Samsung Display is now basically an OLED company. So no QLEDs? Um, no, those LCD panels come from China. That's a bummer. It, um, was, it, it was supposed to be better than OLED. That's what they're saying. That it's a, it's well, a, remember a, that the only bet that Samsung is buying from China is the LCD cell. Okay. And then remember there's Samsung design and technology in the backlight and in the, um, in the quantum dot sheet and the signal processing and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way that Samsung doesn't make all, all the other components itself. Yeah, there's the, the bits where Samsung can make a difference and add value, they'll do themselves. Other things you, you buy on the open market and the LCD cell, the bit that does the switching of the light, you can buy from China. Okay. And they don't see it as being something that is sufficiently visible to the consumer and offers a real difference that's worth paying for. Yeah, for the consumer. Although the Chinese are playing catch up uh, with uh, the technology and al always they improving are, yeah. on their own brands, be right behind the uh, Samsung and LG. Um, yeah, but it, but the the LCD cell is not a differentiator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Samsung, it's the system. Okay. Okay. So that's where where Samsung has gone. Um, they are aiming to build technology barriers that the Chinese will find it very difficult to enter, which is OLED emissive displays. Yeah. Okay. They've been the leader in RGB OLED in small screens for mobile phones for 10 years. Very, very long time. Yeah. They, they, they start off as the leader. They're still the leader. Samsung Galaxy S2 was already in AMOLED. Also Galaxy yeah. S. Yep. Was the first one so, on AMOLED. So, so that, you know, they've been doing it a very long time. They've disproportionately taken the value out of the market. And there are other people who've invested in OLED who are struggling to even get their fabs 25% loaded. To get into the business is hard. And to get into the business, you have to sell products to get the yield up and the factory performance up. But nobody wants to buy from you until you've got a mature product and a of mature course. process. So they're in a... 
um, they can't get started because they're not in the business and they're not in the business because they can't get started. The skin in the egg problem. So, so Samsung and LG, um, their display divisions have a defensible business in OLED emissive displays. They've got the experience, they've got the manufacturing knowledge, they've got very high yields, the products are superb. What is the secret sauce in uh, OLED? Huge amounts of R&D and huge amounts of production experience that goes with it. Uh, and that, that is the difference. That you remember when OLED TV came out, then those first ones in what, 2013, they were probably running at 10% yield. So this is the end of Samsung and LG making an awful lot of broken glass and 10 years of experience. Literally, because you've been telling me in 2013, look at these TVs, it's a more than 100,000 a piece because yep. there's at least 10 more broken... 10, 10 more panels that, ne that never made it, yeah. And you remember the first ones that we used to see at, at IFA, they all had blemishes on them, they're dead yes. pixels. And you know, the first year, I think I'd, I'd see sort of 20, 30, 40 on, 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 on an example in the show. The next year, I'd see 10, the next year, I'd see five, and now you never see them. Yeah, and if you they, buy they, one in the shops, it will not have a dead pixel on it. Yeah. Exactly, and they all always had, uh, let's say, OLEDs to replace in the in the in the show. Yeah, in case uh, someone that's goes right. broke. You know, and, and now you never see that. It, it's you know, it's a mature product, and so that's very very difficult for anybody else to come into now. That there's um, that took years. It, it took years, and that's a huge amount of experience that's gone. That's in uh, your buying. At that least at least ten years. At least yeah. ten years and uh, tens of billions. Um, yeah, and some big investments in fab capacity. If OLED is to grow again, then people will have to invest in more fab capacity. So Samsung display and LG display will have to invest in more fab capacity. But do they actually need OLED? Because LCDs are becoming better and better. Look at, it, I, I, we are talking about QLED. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, there's certainly you can make a high-end LCD that looks every bit as good as an OLED. It's different. It's different. Yeah, it, it can be brighter, but the black levels are probably never going to be quite as good as the OLED. Um, so it, it, they're, they're slightly different products. Okay. Um, the question is, can you do it at the right cost? Okay. And OLED now being a mature technology, then it's putting up a very difficult cost barrier for mini LED, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that mi getting mini LED display displays and TVs that have OLED-like performance and OLED-like costs is hard. Okay. And we, we've been seeing also OLEDs becoming bigger and bigger. Yep. There's also that, uh, let's say, competition on size. Once yep. uh, you get it right, the technology gets right. Yep. But also, they, I understand there's, there's still that problem when you make them bigger, yep. the rate of failure also increases exponentially. Right. Yeah, because it's an area um, effect. So if you have a certain probability that you're going to find a problem in, say, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, if you double the size, you quadruple the area. Yeah. Yes. So, so as you say, it then goes exponential. Um, you also have problems with uniformity. The larger the area, the difference between that side and that side mm -hmm. get much bigger. And you could make, let's say you're making 110 inch, you could make four good 55 inches which are okay on uniformity but if you make a single 110 inch which is like those tile four the four acceptable ones are not good enough between that corner and that corner on okay. uniformity so there is an extra effect as well so you're right it's exponential and it's area related so this is why big oled tvs are so expensive yeah and there's also the issue of transporting them and uh, they are very, very slim, very thin, very, yeah. very fragile. Um, probably no different to LCD. Okay. I mean, remember that those LCD um, TVs have a 0.6 millimeter thick sheets of glass in them. So when you get, I think, above about 75 inch, um, or, certain, or certainly above 65 inch, people have to start putting metal into the cabinets again just to support the, uh, the display because the plastic cabinet will twist too much and, and you risk cracking it. Okay. Let's switch to um, uh, monitors because yeah. you've been telling me that also we, we see improvements in the monitors. And uh, in, in uh, 2022, we've, we've seen flexible monitors coming to market. Yeah. And curved monitors are also back in business. They're back, yes. 
How did that come to be? I, I, I think this is, as you, as you well know, George, I've been very skeptical about Curve TV. Of course. Right from the word go, because... Um, you actually convinced me they're useless. <laughs> yep. Um, actually, I, I curve monitors, I think, I, I think are different. And, I've, and, I, and I said that because you're in a fixed viewing point. You're not sharing it with somebody else. Um, yes. and, and it's much more like a cockpit, if you like. As you're, and there are certain things that clearly a curve display makes sense. If you're doing building a flight simulator, for example, you would want to use a curved display. Yes. Um, I think there's an ergonomic advantage in that. You, you know that when you take three displays and put them on your desk, you angle them. Yes. Um, so that you turn your head and you're not watching things obliquely. You want to look at it square on. So I can see a good argument for curved monitors. They're expensive to ship because, of course, the box has to have the whole depth on it. Um, so there's, there's a cost involved in the size, not necessarily yeah. the technology behind it. Yeah, and, and I, and I, but I think there is a, you, you can see just in the way that people arrange monitors on their desk that they approximate to a curve and you can see why people um, want to do that. I think for things like gaming, if you're in widescreen and you're entering a sort of simulator-like environment, yes. again, um, you can make a persuasive argument as to why a curved one works, if for no other reason than it's continuous. But also, it helps with reflections and things like that. Okay. In, in August uh, 2022, we've seen a, a flexible monitor that yeah. you can actually bend with your bare hands. Yeah. So, is that clever? It solves the transport problem. You can put it back in the thin box. I was thinking just about that. <laughs> I don't know, how, I don't know whether that's what that would be like on, on the cost saving. But, yeah, I think this is a... So, the, 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 the basic thing that you can actually... Um, sell it as a flat monitor yep. and then you can bend and it. And you bend it. You, you save a lot of money on transport. Maybe you do. I, I don't know. You know, it's, it, it's one of those fun ones. I, I think it comes back to the point I was making that the monitor industry kind of revived itself and is, is out there hungry looking for new applications, mm -hmm. is looking for new problems to solve. And they're not all pale gray and about that big, you know, which is where the monitor industry was kind of ending up okay. five years ago that they said, well, let's go out and understand consumers, let's understand businesses, what they're trying to do with people's work or, or relaxation or whatever, and let's make monitors to suit all those niches. And that, I think, is what we're seeing, is that people have got away from that sort of Henry Ford Model T monitor thing, that you can yes. have any, anything you like, provided it's... <laughs> 15, 17, know, 19. 15, 17, 19, 16 by 9, and that's it, you that's know, and, and two resolutions. You know. Suddenly people are saying, well, what do people use this stuff for? How do we optimize them? And in the end, if you solve people's problems, you get better profit margins. Yes. Look at the, uh, those Apple guys. Yeah, absolutely. With the uh, XDR displays. Yeah. Those are hugely expensive. What's the actual value of the panel inside of that thing? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> My, could it be uh, more or less than 10%? I, I, to be honest, I really don't know because you've also got to remember that Apple makes things with a lot of metallic components and very high finishes. I, okay. We do do teardowns. I don't know of any teardown information. I don't think we've done one of those. Um, okay. Very clearly that you know Apple, they position their products for very, very demanding display applications. So professional photo and video editing and things like that where you need to very, very accurately understand what is going on and what you're doing so that if you print it or anything else, it but, is reproducible. But still, still, for, come on. Is there a panel more expensive than $1,000? On for monitors, a monitor? like that. To be honest, I'd have to ask my colleagues who, who work on pro AV displays. So I'm pretty sure there are. Certainly for okay. broadcast monitors, yeah, definitely. Okay. You know, and things that, for example, pe people use for color grading and video. Okay. Um, they are wildly more expensive than that. In terms of color grading, we've seen uh, the, the streaming services uh, yeah. going into uh, offering, uh, let's say, um, Netflix color grading or the director's uh, yeah. color grading and stuff like that. So um, OLED TVs now and the latest te uh, technology of TVs offers the possibility of having the same experience as you have it uh, on a professional monitor, on a color grading monitor. I've yeah. seen that with Panasonic. Yeah. And LGs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the content companies ha, ha, have said, we make all this amazing content, and then people watch it on terrible, uncalibrated TVs. Yes. 
why are we spending all this money if people can't see it? <laughs> yeah. To give a good example, when the World Cup uh, was first broadcast in UHD, the TVs didn't react correctly often to HDR content. So some were doing an SDR HDR conversion on H already HDR material. <laughs> so it looked very strange. Yeah. Um, and other ones weren't recognizing when they were getting HDR material. So I think the key one out of this is that people have invested so much money in these um, assets of content, we want to make sure that that investment is visible to the consumer. Yeah, but I, I've been asking the Netflix people about uh, switching to 8K production. Yeah. And I said, not in the near future. No. They're not going to do it. Although we, we can see uh, 8K TVs uh, in Japan, uh, the national uh, um, broadcasting companies yeah. also broadcasting. NHK did. Uh, yeah. some, uh, NHK, uh, they are broadcasting some things on, in 8K. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, th there is one 8K channel in the world, which is BS8K from NHK. 8K has really failed to um, leave the launch pad in Japan. Um, the numbers that ship each year are in the low thousands. So what's the actual innovation in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, video and uh, screens? Because we seem to be stuck on, uh, on 4K for the past yep. 10 years. Yep. 4K is good enough even on very large screens. Absolutely. And you've been telling us that um, you only need 4K from uh, 55 to 75 inch. Right. So I, I think the, <laughs> the innovation, if you like, that we've got to get to is people have to make a good business model out of it. And delivering content is always um, a balance between the cost of the content and what people are prepared to pay for it or what you can support with advertising in the advertising business. And often 4K content has very high costs and yet people will not pay twice as much, for example, as SDR HD content. Okay. Um, people in broadcast um, studios, for example, the equipment is solid, it's built to last, and it's meant to last 20 years. We went through the HD transition. People really don't want to go and refit their studios again in 4K. I'm Rip not sure we're going to see t the TV studios no. switching to 4K ever. They, they won't, you know, and, and there's a lot of, I mean, certainly even in many countries, a lot of the things like local news stations, even from a national broadcaster, they produce an SD. Why? SD because that is what the market can stand. Okay. Um, that, is, that is the cost um, that gives a payback. Um, mm -hmm. You look in, in the US, then with the exception of the streamers, then they've been very, very cautious investments in 4K um, and UHD broadcast. Um, and they're very, very mindful of the business case on that. And a lot of this equipment is incredibly expensive. So to give an example in the, in the World Cup in 2018, um, each lens costs hundreds of thousands of dollars for a big camera that you have for a football stadium. Mm -hmm. um, and they would have six to 10 of those big cameras plus the other cameras for you know, goal line and things like that. The crews flew between the different sites for the different games with the lenses. Though the camera bodies were all installed and on the rigs, they came along, carried the lens up, mounted it. Um, and, and if you look at an 8K lens, then you're going to be talking almost millions of dollars for a lens. And you know, so, so the, these things don't come free of cost. Camera bodies are cheap. You know, this is, they're semiconductor-based devices and you can buy 8K camera bodies you know, at, at, at relatively accessible prices. The lenses don't scale. We are, you, we are recording in uh, 4K on a mirrorless. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and you look at the performance of mirrorless cameras, uh, and you look, for example, at things like the, the sensitivity of them, the resolution. You know, that, that 30 years ago would as a military night vision device sort of performance. <laughs> you know, quite incredible um, sort of change in the technology there. You know, you can take that. You can take that camera and in the dark, press the shutter, um, and you'll get a, you'll get a 
really good black and white image. So that bit has moved at semiconductor speed, but making glass lenses hasn't gone through that. It's not that kind of business. Um, Why is that? Because it's physics, it's basic physics, it's, it's, it's analog in the end. Um, and you can't just shrink it, it's not got the magic of the semiconductor industry. So there are these, a lot of these things going on. There is a change going on in broadcasting at the moment, which is um, a transition from having the conventional video streams, digital video, to moving studios to IP. So it just become, it goes from being video to just being data. Yeah. Yes. You can see that, for example, in all the way through to end broadcast in the United States, where the ATSC3 standard is, uses IP packets for, for the video encoding. Okay. Um, and, and I think that that migration to treating video as data rather than something separate will help bring costs down, but people have to refit their studios and their broadcasts. So that I think is the next transition that we will start to see and maybe enables um, more UHD in future. I can see some change in that sense because um, even um, Samsung has announced that you will be able to stream some TV channels to your TV set. Yeah. And um, many, many, comp uh, let's say, TV stations are now being right. streamed instead of broadcasted. Absolutely. Um, a good example of that is the Sky Glass TV in the UK, okay. which is from the main satellite pay TV provider, Sky. Also, of course, they're in, in Germany and, um, uh, uh, and other places. And that TV, though it's from a satellite TV provider, it doesn't have a satellite tuner. You just plug, you just connect it to a net, plug it in, connect it to the network, and it, it does everything by streaming. Um, and I think yes. many national broadcasters see their future exactly as you say, that you don't need towers, you don't need to do broadcast terrestrially, you do it on IP. You no longer see dishes on... Um on, I, don't, I don't know, any buildings. Yeah. No, the, 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 the dishes are slowly disappearing. Um, and uh, the use of, of, of over-the-air broadcast, be it from satellite or, um, uh, or terrestrial, is, is slowly going to disappear. So what about, what about the satellites in the sky? What's happening to those? Um, well, if you look at the satellite industry, then there's a lot of consolidation going on. Really? Yeah, um, because... Consolidation the, means... Uh, um, between the companies operating satellites. Merging and acquiring. So, for example, you know, look at the, uh, the various things going on with um, Utelsat and, um, a, a, and other uh, satellite operators. Um, that certainly the satellite business that, that was growing and growing and growing, now people with uh, using internet streaming has got sufficiently good and there's enough capacity that you don't need to do it from satellite. There are, you know, let, let's also remember though that satellite does do some wonderful things that you still can't do with, with, with internet streaming, that in the end, internet streaming, you've got to go and dig up the street and you've got to go and lay cable or fiber. Not necessarily, you've got uh, Starlink now. Um, that, is, that is a different solution and we'll see where, where that goes. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think conventional satellite can still do some things, okay. um, and geostationary satellites certainly have their place that they can cover whole continents with okay. one single thing. And if you live on the wrong side of a mountain or in a narrow valley, um, you can probably get still get satellite, um, even though you, you're shadowed for terrestrial broadcast or you're in a remote area or on an island where they haven't got, given you a cable. That's a possibility, but is it a, a, an actual uh, 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 that's a probability, but not a possibility right now. So no, nobody is actually leveraging that, let's say, bandwidth that uh, is unused now. So you have that's a, right. a lot of satellites just sitting up there. They are, yeah. And and I think the there there are people who know more about this than me, um, who'll be able to give you the you know the right numbers about the amount of unused capacity, and indeed what the replacement rate of those assets will be. If your satellite's up there and flying, then. Um, that's one thing because it's an existing asset that you've paid for and you've just got the operating cost. It's something else to decide to invest in launching more, more, more satellites. So we might see um, 
the satellite business becoming cheaper than even streaming because it's unused capacity? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting thought. Um, I would have to ask my colleagues on that one to, okay. to, 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 to answer that one. Uh, we went through a lot. I, I would like to have you uh, for more than that, but I know you have a, f a busy schedule. Um, I would like to uh, go into consumer goods just for a few minutes, yep. if you allow. Okay. So we've been talking about screens, screens, screens everywhere. Yep. I, and I've been telling you before we started the interview that I've seen this trend from um, LED screens to LCD screens yes. to OLED screens yep. on everything, yep. even on washers. Yes. So um, how much of those screens um, might be an indicator of uh, better performance and how much of those are just for marketing purposes? Um, I, I think it's one of those ones, it, it, it's the way that consumers um, assess products that it's in the eye of the beholder it's in the eye of the beholder you, you you remember it always used to be a case um when, when if you bought a car you'd slam the door and yeah. then where did it go clunk or clang uh, <laughs> yeah okay then the car all the car makers good at, got good at making car doors that all went clunk no matter how the car was made um <laughs> but that yeah. that was one of those things that you you did to assess quality i i notice now that you see washers with click wheels on them um, and you see, as you say, beautiful displays that, you know, like the, the tail of the peacock say, look at me. Um, and it's a way that signals quality in the same way that you, the material choices and things like that. And it's a beauty contest. Um, okay. And very definitely consumers like displays like that. They like gorgeous displays. They want products with gorgeous displays on them. And like the peacock's tail, <laughs> they, they do better in the market or, or brands clearly believe that they will do better in the market. So it's becoming an important part of the product that the, the user interface and the look and feel, I think, are, are becoming more and more um, critical at the top end of the market. Clearly, the bottom end consumers are very much more functional okay. based. But the, the people that are focused on function, how much are they losing? Um, and how much are the others gaining? Because from what I'm seeing, the same washer, one generation to the other, just by this evolution. I've been talking to the guys in the industry. We're going to talk a lot with yeah. one of your, more, yeah, uh, one of your, of your I colleagues. Was, I was going to say, my colleague Amir Lasic will, uh, will be able to go into this in much more about what you get with the extra performance. You know, a lot of that is exactly. about, um, energy consumption. Um, and, uh, and he understands far better than me but, on that. But beyond that, because we're going to go into details because that's fascinating to, to see how it's all evolving. I was looking at price. Yeah. And uh, so someone that cannot afford the latest is going to buy, let's say, the previous, uh, the second, let's say, yep. uh, generation behind. And he's going to pay half price for the same uh, series from the latest. Yeah. So what's... Do you feel it, there is a 100% um, improve on performance <laughs> together with design and screens? It's, yeah, I, I, th I think it's always one of those things that the kitchen is not just a place for making food. Yeah. Okay. Um, depending on the country you live in and the building style, then often the kitchen is open plan with the living room and people want, because it's an extension of the living room, to have beautiful appliances and beautiful kitchens. Uh, in many places, you know, you even see that people have beautiful kitchens and we know, you, we, and you know they don't cook. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's a, it's a status symbol, you know, and, okay. and, and so I, I, I think we have to remember that in the same way that people don't buy cars just to move, um, they use it to express themselves. Of course. Um, and, um, and, and advertise their identity and, and things like that. Then, then kitchen appliances for some people um, are, part of, are part of that. And, yeah. and you can call it conspicuous consumption or whatever you want to do, but yeah. it's more than just functional. Yeah. Over the years, we've been talking about uh, all kinds of screens. Yeah. We've seen uh, the rise uh, of curved screens, yeah. rollable screens, uh, then freeform screens, like yeah. the sh sharp people are doing yeah. for the automotive industry. Now we see screens everywhere. We've seen yeah. the hyper screen in the Mercedes, one end to the other. Yeah. So do you feel like uh, screens are evolving into um, a marketing strategy or an actual use case? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think that's, I think that's a, uh, a great question. Certainly, I, I think we're approaching a new stage where 
let's just go away from thinking, thinking of them as screens and let's just call them active surfaces. So it's no longer about just displaying information. It's about setting um, uh, a tone and ambience in, in a space. For example, you've seen how um, the, the way that the prices have fallen in um, LED displays in hotels. Now you often have a foyer where the, is it a display? Well, it's not just sitting there with telling you about conferences. It's also an active surface that you know, changes the lights and patterns with the mood and the event or the time of day. Um, is it, well, it, technically it's a display, but it's more than that. Um, and, and I think that's where we're seeing that, um, for example, in a car, yes, you need a speedometer and to know whether you've run out of fuel or charge or whatever. Most of the rest of the information you don't really need. Um, but people like that and... Um, eyes on the road, eyes on the road. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's an interesting one with head-up displays in cars that people tend to turn off all the information other than the speed because that's all that people want. And that is a danger that all these active surfaces, if they're displays, they just overwhelm you with information. Um, but at the same time, I think for use in architectural um, mood setting environments and things like that, there is a lot more to do and it's not going to be just advertising, I hope. So for the near future, you're looking at <clears throat> ways of uh, the screens are going to, I don't know, mix with reality, enhance the uh, yeah. real world, let's say. Or, or they become more architectural. More architectural. So you, you, you see, for example, that people are playing with these, these ideas already with things like the, um, the way that now you have active lighting that changes color and, and tone with, you know, um, with time of day, with what you're doing, whether you're watching a movie or, or whatever. And that lighting has gone from functional with a bit of design to being far more dynamic. So um, more, more form than function. I think the function is different. Yeah, it's not just a straight one of task lighting, you know, which, which yes. you do with three yeah. strip lights, that it's about setting mood and tone and things okay. like that. It's more architectural, it's about setting an ambience. And I think we'll see more of that with the displays. Um, we saw OLED um, panels, for example, for lighting begin to appear. Uh, and I think we'll see more of those. Yes, it's a different thing to a display. It doesn't have lots of individual pixels. Um, but again, I, I think we'll see those continue to evolve. And the last question, I promise, <laughs> is the uh, screens going into the VR? Yeah. Because uh, if you want to have a good VR headset, it needs to be OLED and it needs to be at least 120 hertz or more. Oh, yeah. And high density. Uh, yeah. Where are we with the technology? Because it, uh, it's no longer dizzying. Uh, a few years it's, back, it was making you nauseous. Yeah, it was, it was a processing making me problem. Nauseous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my teenage son said to me, um, this is a strange product. You put it on, um, you get all sweaty and you feel sick. And after five minutes, you take it off. What's the point? Uh, <laughs> He's right. And, and a lot of that was actually the processing issues that you just could not process enough pixels fast enough. Those problems are slowly being solved. I think after that, you've still got the human interface problem what are you actually trying to do and in the end i think it's an artistic challenge to create um content in a new way for this whole new form of perception okay um, in the same way that imax cinema is notably different to conventional cinema which is different to tv <laughs> um, and, and I think that there is an artistic challenge as much as anything else to create content that is not exhausting and overwhelming mm -hmm. um, when your entire field of view is, is, is filled. Um, and, and people will be experimenting. Who's ahead on this? Because uh, Facebook changed their name to Meta and they're showing the, uh, some pixelated uh, advanced yeah. project that they're working on, the Cambria project and stuff like that, human in interface and all that. But we all come back to screens and what we actually see and how we, let's say, get into, we get yeah. transported into that environment. Yeah, I, I think, to be honest, that we saw a, that huge surge of investment, you know, for example, by, uh, by Facebook and companies like Magic Leap it was another one. You know, vast amounts of money went into that, that company. And Although they don't, they don't actually sell so right. much. So I, I think we're still at the point where everything that we're seeing is, if not a prototype, it is 
unfinished in the sense that it hasn't got to the, the end destination. Um, and we still have to expect another f probably five and realistically probably 10 more years of evolution. Um, so the VR headset from Apple is going to be a thing for 2030? I, I think we're at the beginning of the story, not, the, not even the middle. Not even, okay. And they're not going to do it uh, if they're not sure it's going to be successful. I, I think that there are a lot of things that you have to think about um, when, you, when you do that. And the key one is really understanding how people perceive their vision, um, making something that's not overwhelming. Okay. Um, you know, and and to, to give an example of how difficult this problem is, you know, NASA has been putting people into space uh, since, since, what, 1962, and they still don't reliably know how well your performance on motion sickness when you're on the ground in their tests compared to what happens when you're in, the, uh, in a spacecraft. Okay. You know, these things are very subtle and very individual, and I think that there's a lot of um, learning and experience that has to be gone through to create something that people find relaxing to use. But if we've been talking about music streaming, video streaming, cloud yeah. gaming, yeah. VR should naturally be the next big thing. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, and certainly, you know, what, in the way that TV content has become more movie-like and movie content has become more TV-like, we're now seeing that same blurring extension going on that movies and games look more like each other. Um, yes. And sometimes I wonder when I see some movies as to whether I'm watching a Twitch stream. Yeah, because you know that the whole thing is an entirely synthetic CGI world. There's, there's newscasters that have mistaken uh, gameplay from, uh, yeah. uh, let's say, uh, war games yeah, yeah. for actual war footage. That's right. There were certain things that were allegedly uh, news, news reporting in Ukraine. And, and then someone yes. said, no, hang on, this is actually... Starcraft or something? Uh, yeah. Call of Duty. Yeah, there, there, were, there, there were some things that were actually, it was entirely synthetic. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, and, and of course, we talk about deep fakes in video. So... Yes. Have you got another hour for that? No. Uh, it, that is way outside my expertise. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Paul Gray, thank you for taking okay. the time. George, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm actually grateful for you uh, uh, offering some insights. And uh, if people want to know more about you, we're going to link you down below. Uh, yep, thank you. And I hope I'll see you just as fresh and uh, uh, <laughs> well informed in the near future. Thank you very much indeed. Always Thanks. a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Paul. Thanks. Îți mulțumesc dacă ai urmărit acest IG de LCC. Sper că ți-a adus informații valoroase. Eu știu sigur că am luat o lecție uh, gratis despre niște lucruri care costă foarte mult și genul acesta de informație, vă spuneam, este extrem, extrem de valoroasă. Așadar, dacă ne-ai urmărit aici, suntem recunoscători. Nu uitați să dai un like, un share și un subscribe și mai data viitoare să-ți fie numai bine.